Bibles will be showing it to you in a moment. <clears throat> we are still in our series, really an in-depth study into spiritual transformation of the believer. Um, we've been working on this for a while. It's sort of an underlying theme of much of our teaching and preaching here at Grace Connection. We talk a lot about what you got to, what I believe is an Im imperative information for a Christian to understand if they're going to become like Christ. Certain Bible doctrines like justification, adoption, and some of these, we'll break it down, describe it different ways. And, but understanding those things, I, I need to know what the cross did for me. I need to know who I am in Christ and where I stand in Christ if I'm going to become like Christ. If I'm going to walk like Christ, become Christ-like um, in my life, then, then I've got to understand what the cross did for me, number one. Number, number two, we have spent four weeks on what we call the unalterable condition. What condition can't be altered and needs to, this, this one condition of the soul must be in place if I'm going to experience spiritual transformation. Of course, we spoke about the Lordship of Christ. If Jesus is not preeminent in my life, how can I expect the Holy Spirit to come in and actually transform me and make me like Christ if I'm still trying to control my own life? Now, granted, the preeminence of Christ, the Lordship of Christ is an ongoing illumination that God shows us throughout our life and and um, with areas that we hold for our own control of such. and doing, But when, as he reveals these things to us, and we submit them to Christ, the, the process of spiritual transformation continues. Now we're going into what I, I call internal soul graces. Um, I didn't call that. Somebody else called it. I stole it. But it's, it's graces of the soul. What, do I, what sort of um, qualities, that's a good word, qualities do I need to have in, in my inner man if God is going to continually transform me and keep the process of spiritual transformation in my life? And we want to spend the next three or four weeks on them, and I think you'll find them um, important to um, understand. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 16, David here at the, in this time was physically weary, and you can read the whole chapter, and it sort of brings this out. He's in the middle of... Um, what they, we call the Absalom re Rebellion. His son Absalom was trying to kill him and overthrow the kingdom, and David was in, at war with his own son and trying to hold the kingdom in his power. Um, he was emotionally drained because obviously what he was dealing with, with his son and such. And then as he's traveling, he was, he was confronted by an angry, embittered man. Second Samuel chapter 16, verse 5. And David came to Chicago... <laughs> Let's use English words for this. It makes a little bit. Bahurim, a man came out of the village cursing them. It was Shimei, the son of Gera, the same clan as Saul's family. So this man is a descendant of Saul. He threw stones at the king and the king's officers and all the mighty warriors who surrounded him. So here's this guy. They're traveling, and this guy comes out, starts cursing the king, starts picking up rocks and throwing them at the king and at the soldiers. Get out of here, you murderer, you scoundrel, he shouted at David. The Lord is paying you back for all the bloodshed in Saul's clan. You stole his throne, and now the Lord has given it to your son Absalom. At last you will taste some of your own medicine, for you are a murderer. Now, imagine, we said in the first service, imagine if that was President Obama. And not, or any president, not picking on President Obama, any president. You go up and see the presence. One thing to yell things at. I'm not sure people do that. But if you all of a sudden picked up a rock and tried to throw it at the president of the United States, what would happen? It would be a pig pile, yeah, and you'd be on the bottom of it, and it would be 72 secret agents or secret service on top of you, and probably about 23 taser um, prongs all over your body as you're just vibrating on the ground. And, um, because you wouldn't get very far because there's security. Well, he has his army around him. And they did things a little bit different back then. Now we just taser them, put them in jail, and feed them for the rest of their life. Back then, they just off with the head. <laughs> they just take off. They just, they just, they just take, take their head off. Verse 9. Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Abishai's son of Zeruah demanded. Let me go over and cut off his head. <laughs> no, the king said. Who asked your opinion? You sons of Zeruah, Zeruiah. If the Lord has told him to curse me, who are you to stop him? It's quite a statement. Then David said to Abishai and to his servants, My own son is trying to kill me. 
doesn't this relative of Saul have even more reason to do so? Leave him alone. And let him curse. For the Lord has told him to do it. And perhaps the Lord will see that I am being wronged and will bless me because of these curses today. So David and his men continued down the road, and Shimei kept pace with them on a nearby hillside, cursing as he went and throwing stones at David and tossing dust. That was a symbol of disrespect, tossing dust into the air. And the king of all who were with him grew weary along the way, so they rested when they reached the Jordan River. What David expressed here was a quality that would wipe out most local church ministry problems. The biggest enemy confronting the local church is the local church. We self-destruct. I'm not saying this church, a church is as a rule, especially in America. This quality would resolve most marriage issues. It would resolve much emotional stress. It would eliminate people trapped in a lifestyle of consistent self-justification. It could heal broken families. It could heal broken families. It could cure those that are afflicted with something I've called the disease of victimhood. It simply, the quality of meekness. It can start those who are spiritually stalled. You might know what I mean. It can make real people's faith that has become plastic. It can restore to you the joy of your salvation. Without this internal grace, quality of meekness, spiritual transformation, at best, will be muted. And again, I think David reveals this so clearly in this passage, and you'll see as we define it. Now, understand this. When I say the word meekness in my English vocabulary, it has very little connection to the biblical idea of meekness. When I use the word meekness in my English, you, you sort of think that's a meek person. He's a guy that is not outspoken. He's a person that's sort of subservient, um, doesn't really have an opinion about much, and would do anything to avoid confrontation. And that was somehow might be embedded in your English idea of what meekness is. But that is so contrary to a biblical idea of meekness. Meekness in the Bible is dramatically different than meekness in our English. Meekness, the Greek and the Hebrew word, they, they mean very similar things. And we're going to continue this in Psalm 37, verse 11, where David said, Blessed be the meek. We're going to look into the, the Hebrew idea of this a little bit more on Wednesday night. But it simply means one under perfect control. Now watch this. Strength under control. This is the biblical idea. I got five or six um, different definitions for you here. It'll give you a full orb view of what biblical meekness is. It's not only outward behavior. It's not merely in his relations to others, the meek person's relations to others. Nor is it in his natural disposition. Get me? That's very important. Sometimes it's just embedded in our temperaments. You'll find somebody with a laid-back temperament who doesn't really care about fighting any big fights in their life. They're just laid back. And that's a meek person. Well, maybe, but maybe that's just their temperament. Meekness doesn't know temperament. It does not know a, a choleric, a, a strong-willed person, a loud person, a leader or a non-leader. It, it's not something that, biblically speaking, submits to a temperament. Meekness is something the Spirit of God does in a Christian's heart. 
It is an inward grace of soul that is experienced primarily towards God. See what he just said there? Whoever said that? <laughs> Meekness is experienced towards God. It's not experienced towards you. It may manifest towards the, the horizontal human relationship, but it's experienced towards God. And that's what meekness is. Number two, it's a quality of spirit that accepts God's dealings with us as good without disputing or resistance. In parentheses there is my expert commentary, even if we hate it. <laughs> Quality of spirit that accepts God's dealings with us is good without disputing or resistance. Number three, one that doesn't struggle or fight against God. Number four, a condition of mind and heart that yields to action. In other words, you'll have your sword, sword drawn and you say, we've got to act. We've got to defend. We've got to respond. We've got to do something. But meekness says, eh, I don't have to do anything. Because I'm okay not being right. I'm okay not proving my cause. I'm okay being wrong if I need to be wrong. I'm okay with that. Because I don't have my security based in man. I have my security based in God. It's, it's directed towards God, not man. You see how important this is? Watch this. A state of mind not occupied with self at all. We'll see that a little bit later in the, later in the message. It is a heart fixed, excuse me, and focused on God. And if I had to say there was a primary foundational definition, it's probably this last one. It accepts God's word and providential dealings without backtalk, dispute, or questioning. Meekness. There are five qualities that I want to get into. It's actually more than this we can bring out, but for this morning, five qualities of meekness of a meek person. Number one, they are peacemakers. The meek person is a peacemaker, even if they're wrong. A peacemaker is one who brings peace wherever he goes because he is at peace with God. The church of Jesus Christ needs peacemakers like never before. Those who bring Christ into every situation. They build bridges between people. They don't blow them up. Dissension has stopped the work of God in countless churches. Churchianity, fighting over whatever. Pastor Bernstein shared the story many years ago for a church he pastored in West Lauderdale. They had a big church split over hot dogs in the foyer called the Great Hot Dog Church Split. Who cares as long as there's good mustard? Who, who cares? And it's amazing what churches will fight about. It's amazing how many people like controversy. Let's say Paul Brooks, because Paul's, you know, he had a, he's very sweet now, but in his day, he had a, quite a checkered past. It's in my book. <laughs> and, um, and let's say he says something about Sean. Who say anything about Sean? Because he lives an exemplary life. And, um, and, <laughs> and, um, and, and Paul says something about Sean. Now, I, I am blessed, cursed, with the information. Paul says, you know, Sean, da 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 Now, this, this is the unmeek. Sean, you know what Paul said about you? I'll tell you later. Okay. And um, what, what I did, I just caused division. Or I go to three other people. You know what Paul said about Sean? Or Sean's this because Paul told me. What am I doing? Causing division. Here's the meek person. person. Paul says that to me. I hear that, I die with it. Sean comes to me and said, says, did Paul ever say anything about me? And I say, he says, you're awesome. God forgive me for lying. Yeah, I'm, I'm, he says, you're awesome. What am I doing? I'm being a peacemaker. I'm letting the strife die with me. I'm not throwing wood on the fire. Some of us love to keep the controversy going. 
I think it's a great dignity in letting it die with me. In my office and role as a pastor, I hear a lot of things about a lot of situations. One of the great honors I have is when I finally go home to be with the Lord, a lot of stuff's going to go in the grave with me that never should be known by other people. And that is a privilege. If you have been cursed with information, die with it. We had a girl in our church years ago. Some of you remember Dawn McGowan, and she was a sweetheart. She moved to North Carolina. And, um, and she was, and we preached a message similar to this one time. And, and every time, you, if you said anything to Dawn about anybody or anything you didn't like in the church or whatever, she'd put her fingers, she's a professional woman too, she'd put her fingers in her ears and yell. Ah! Until you stop talking. And what are you doing? He goes, I don't want to hear that. Because if, if, if I hear that, then I'm accountable to it, and I don't want to be accountable to it. I like not knowing anything. Solomon said... Knowledge increases what? Yeah. He knew what he was talking about. He knew a lot of stuff. And the more you know, the more you're accountable for. Somebody showed me, I went to a baseball game this past week, and somebody gave me a scorecard and says I wanted to keep scoring. I've been playing baseball since, um, whatever, t-ball. I've never kept score in a baseball game. One time in, what, what am I now, 35, 36 years old? or 55, something like that, somewhere in there. And, um, and I've never kept score one time. You know why? Because as soon as I learned how to keep score, I'd have to do it. So I, I honestly said, so, will you keep score? I don't know how. Sorry, I don't know how. And I didn't know how. I wasn't lying. I never learned because I never wanted to keep score because once you kept score, you had to pay attention. And I didn't want to pay attention because I had a wandering mind. So I never kept score. Knowledge increases sorrow. I'm accountable to what I know. If you are cursed with information, die with the information. Peacemakers frustrate demonic and satanic plans for division. Imagine if information that starts with, if you are um, given information, and if there's a bunch of peacemakers in the church and they die with that information, they never repeat it. Imagine how much church stuff would stop. Imagine how much church stuff would stop if you as a peacemaker hear something about somebody else or, or hear somebody complaining about that or complaining about this, and you say, let's pick up the phone and call them. It's amazing. No, no, it's okay. We're good. We're good. We don't have to know we're good. I'm good. Just forget I said it. Why? If you can say it about them, call them. Bring them into the equation. This person hurt you, offended you, did this. Call them. Pick them up. Call them on the phone. Why are you telling me? I didn't do anything. Tell them. You're the one that's talking about it. That rule will resolve most issues. Before you dial the last number, you'll find out that that division just died on the vine. If somebody senses that you can, you'll, you will be a receptacle for negativity, it'll come your way. Once you shut it down once or twice, it'll stop. If somebody wants to as my friend Pastor Martel says, puke in your ear. <laughs> Once you say, if you're going to puke in my ear, we're going to do it with an open phone line, it will probably stop. And the quote Proverbs 26, verse 20 says, a fire goes out without wood and quarrels disappear where the gossip stops. A quarrelsome person starts fights as easily as hot embers like charcoal or lights wood. So he said, your fire goes out without wood. Just don't be the wood. <laughs> Number two, meekness makes us bold in our convictions. I'm thinking a lot about this um, because meekness in the English has such a, a um, seems like a word of, of, of weakness, but meekness in the Greek and the Hebrew is a word of strength. It's somebody that's very, very confident and secure in who they are. They're not in arrogance, but, they're, but an assurance because they, they are God's and they understand that their agenda is God's agenda or they want God's agenda to be their agenda. So a meek person can be bold in their convictions. They're not s swept away for in, by the world. 
No, we know what I'm getting at here. As a father, let's say, I want to have convictions, or a mother, I want to have convictions for my family. Because I, I want to be bold in the fact I can say no to my children. If my children want, want something that's harmful to them or I deem might be harmful to them, or every other kid has it, or all the world is doing it, and all the world owns it, my, my child doesn't have to have it. Because the key word there is world. I don't have to blend into the world. I can be different from the world. In fact, I never see anywhere in the scriptures where the church is told to blend in. I'm, I see in the scriptures where the church is called to be a light and to shine and to be different, to have a standard, a value, a priority system that is different than the world systems. Because when you start interrogating and questioning people that live in this world system, they're not really happy about it. They're not singing, this world is a wonderful place. Where I work is so great, everyone's so positive. You don't hear that that much. You hear full letter words and cursing and, and slandering and gossip and all sorts of crazy stuff when you work out there, don't you? So why do they want somebody just like them? What is there attractive to them if we're acting just like them? How would that ever attract them to the light? That's in you. It doesn't. Listen, my friends, what I put in front of my eyes matters. What I listen to matters. What I dump in my brain all day matters. I can't take a big old chunk of the world system and say, it doesn't bother me. It does. It impacts you. What you eat physically impacts you. What you eat spiritually impacts you. If I'm listening to the Word of God, if I'm, if I'm spending a five, ten minutes a week in the Word of God, yet I'm spending um, 23 hours in front of the epi boobus tubus, oh my. That's Greek. You didn't know that in Greek, but just epi and oh my at the end makes anything Greek. <laughs> if, I, if I do that, then what do I expect is going to happen in my soul? Truthfully, I'm not a legalist. But I'm into being like Christ. And if you sat in my chair and you talked to the people I talked to and you, answered, and you talked to the struggles and the nightmares and the depression and the discouragement and all the things that people face um, on, a, on, a, on a large scale on a week-to-week -week basis, and some of that stuff is real and it's physical and you can't do anything about it, but some of it is your diet. What are you eating? I'm not talking food talking spiritually speaking. Don't be afraid to have a standard. The world, my friends, is weird. The world is, not you. The world is. God has a standard which is normal. God has a standard which he esteems. That's normal. I love Washman E's book, The Normal Christian Life. He talked about a normal Christian life. Not a Christian life that evolved and, and, and found its place in the world system. The, the normal Christian life is contrary to the world system. So the world is the ones that really need to change, not the church. Number three, the meek person remains teachable throughout their life. This is such a key point and a key understanding of meekness. Pro, I'm sorry, Psalms 25 Verse 9 says, the meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek he will teach his way. Only one that can be, who is teachable can be transformed. And this is one of the great fruits of the word. Listen to me. If the word of God has not rattled your cage in the last few years, it's time for a spiritual checkup. My cage, walking with God 30 plus years and preaching and teaching and pastoring, my spiritual cage gets rattled on a weekly basis. God's tapping on my shoulder saying, Tim, this is a miss in your life. You need a, this is an area of warning over here. Protect yourself over here. My, my cage gets rattled all the time. Because when I get up early and spend time with the Lord, I, I quiet myself. My first thing I say to God when, after my coffee which God's given me as a gift. <laughs> Say, God, make me meek. In other words, 
when I read the scriptures, I want to hear from you. When I read my devotionals that I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, read that every morning, that I want to hear from God in those devotionals. When I spend time in prayer, I want to hear the Spirit of God speak to me in prayer. I don't just want to go through the motions. I want to hear the Spirit of God speak to me and convict me of things in prayer. When I work out and I put on my preaching, I usually listen to one or three different preachers. When I work out, I listen to one or two messages a day. And I listen to those that God speak to me through these other men. Speak to me. And I humble my heart. I'm not farming the messages I hear from sermon material. I'm not reading the devotionals to use it on Sunday morning. I'm doing it because I want to be a Christian. And I want to be teachable throughout my life. Listen, don't dismiss any teacher. Uh, you, you have a pastor, you choose, you come, you listen to me teach, and amen, I thank you for that. But you can put anyone up here. And they could say one word, one sentence that God could use in your life. You could be that radio preacher. I'm going to tell you something that might shock you. It could even be your wife. Yeah. Or that unspiritual husband of yours. You're working on him, though. You're working on him. I had a situation a few years back, well, many years ago now, where I had a very, very um, regular attending lady in my church and, and, um, and a husband that never attended. And, um, but he was a good husband, hard worker, and had a common sense. And she was a, she was a good lady, but a little bit, um, I would call it subjective or hyper-spiritual. In other words, she saw... Her, she was, okay, she was a little weird, but, 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 but it was, um, but we had, um, and, and she would go, and she'd be so upset over her unspiritual husband. What am I going to do with my unspiritual husband? And every day it was about her unspiritual husband. It was an amazing thing, because this guy was as even keeled as even keeled could be. And she was like, Wah! all over the place. She, would, um, she was an emotional kite in a hurricane. <laughs> she was just everywhere, in mind and emotions. And her husband would just come and speak to her, say, honey, just, and she ah, come down. I wouldn't put that guy on my deacon board, but he had a voice inside his wife's life. He was a calming voice to her. And I remember watching that back then. I said, isn't this interesting how God's using this man? Because she was a godly girl, and he ended up being a pretty godly guy too, by the way. A, year, a few years later, he got saved, and there was really a great story at, at the end of that story. But um, I was taking, I remember thinking back then, here's what I would call a woman that's very spiritual. Everyone was like, whoa, she's amazing. And here's a guy that was just like, hey, and doing, doing a remote thing. And, and, um, but he was the one that had an even spirit, not her. So maybe you want to hear something from your spouse. If your wife tells you something, guys, listen. Ladies, if your husband tells you something, listen. God may be using them. I'm going to tell you a secret. In Numbers chapter 22, some of you might know the story. Balaam was a prophet of God. And, and Balak was a bad guy. And he wanted Balaam to curse um, Israel. So he says, Balaam, I will give you money if you curse Israel. Balaam said, how much? And, um, and so, something like that. And so he said, okay. And so they're going to curse Israel for the second time. The first time I didn't have to read it again to get my story exactly right. And all of a sudden, um, Balaam's donkey. King James has a different word for it. Balaam's donkey um, pins him against the wall, steps on his foot, and starts talking to him. He starts beating the donkey. Get off my foot. Whacking the donkey. The donkey looks at him. What are you hitting me for? You're the one rebelling against God. Now, if my Maltese ever spoke to me, it would freak me right out. <laughs> First of all, the breath would be really bad, but, but, it was, um, but it would just wig me out. This donkey starts talking to him. Or if my Maltese started talking to me, I might listen. I might think that somebody has taken over her vocal cords, and I might have a message for me. Well, this donkey had a message. God was using the donkey to talk to Balaam. Yes, he can use your husband. <laughs> and again, I'm being gracious with donkey. <laughs> we could call it a much more biblical name 
than that if we wanted to. So what I'm saying is when all of a sudden you hear somebody speaking, don't ever think you can't receive from somebody else. The least in the body of Christ may have a word for you if you're willing to hear it. I'm going to say this, just move on. It's unfortunate, but we do have social classes in Christ's church. I'm talking universal. In other words, we, see, we, we draw lines. I can hear from this person. I can hear from that person. I can hear from this person. But this person, they're from a different social strata. Maybe they come from a different background than me. I don't know if I could really hear from that person. We never define it. It's unspoken, but it's true. Meekness is open to hear the voice of God from anybody, anytime. Number three. They accept God's dealings with you as good because meekness knows God is good. Again, these are from the core definition. Trials, testing comes into life. We accept it because God, even in great heartache, and even when we don't understand, but we accept it because we know that all God's dealings with us is good. It doesn't mean we paint a Christian smile on our face and pretend to be inhuman emotionless beings it simply means that we submit to what God at the very least has allowed to happen the meek fight within themselves not to let circumstances define who God is that's a very important sentence the meek fight within themselves not to let circumstances define who God is. You're very aware of my loss and my family. If I was to tell you it was easy, this road, I would be lying to you, and I don't think you expect me to say that anyway. It has been more than one instant in the last year plus that I've stood before the Lord and resubmitted my life. It's been many more than one times when I've looked at God and said, okay, God, I don't understand this. I don't know why you've done it. There's no answer. I don't see the good in it. It has taken my life and breath away. But I'll acknowledge you for who you are, the Lord, and I'll submit to you a plan that you have allowed, at the very minimum, allowed in my life. I did that about two or three months after we lost our Hannah, and then I probably have done that five times since because I keep taking it back. <laughs> the roller coaster of grief will come in, and I'll get hardened, and I'll get mad, and I'll get bitter again, and I'll fight, and I'll wrestle with God, and then God brings me to a place where I say, okay, God, I have no place else to go. You have the words. If there's hope, then it's you. So this is a bitter pill, but I'll accept it. I'll accept it. Meekness accepts God's dealings with us as good. Good is a very broad term. I don't know what that really means, per se. Um, I don't think it means good things are going to happen. I don't think it means that. I just think it means things happening in your soul, things happening in the inner man. I've talked to way too many parents that have lost children that you can't draw any good event back to that loss at all. But something at the very minimum happens on the inside. And this really dovetails into the next and final point. Meekness, according to Spurgeon, has an absence of selfishness. The very essence of the word, preotes, means we take the emphasis of our life, of what we think we should have, the offense that was against us, or the unfairness of God's providence, God's plan in our life, and we place all that focus on Christ and his kingdom. So in other words, we take self and we park it 
this is my pain, this is my desires, this is my loss, and this is what I want, this is where we, we just take out stuff. No, I'm not, I'm parking me, and I'm looking at the kingdom. If I'm not focused on myself, I don't have to defend myself. <laughs> Only my self-life can be offended, my spirit cannot. When I am pursuing something or want something and people get in the way and they wound me or they say things about me, what is really being offended? My self-life. Meekness has an absence of selfishness. This is, what, this is why the word is so strong. It's why a word of strength and not of, of weakness. Because I draw our life from God. It's all me and God. I understand it's me and Jesus. I'm submitting to Jesus. I'm submitting to his plan. And by submitting to his plan and receiving from him and remaining teachable, what happens is I'm, I'm going to love you because that's his plan. I'm going to lay down my life for you because that's his plan. It's not really about me and you. It's about me and Jesus. You're the recipient of my relationship with Jesus. So this relationship comes from me, and it goes out this way. That's how meekness impacts the church of Christ. That's how it impacts the body of Christ. When self comes in, self means that I'm trying to draw something from here and not from here. So you violated my self-life, and I'm going to be wounded, I'm going to be hurt, I'm going to be let down or whatever. As realistic and as real and, and valuable sometimes as that is, and valid as that is, and natural as that is. But meekness says I have an absence of selfishness. Now this is easy in the little things, but it's not quite as easy in the big things. See, we were created, my friends, to worship him. And let him be the focus, truly, of our adoration. You were made for that. You were made to worship him. You were made to praise him. When you go to Revelation chapter 5 and you see the church of Jesus Christ around the throne, what are we doing? We're praising him. And we're taking our crowns and we're throwing them at his feet. We were praising him. We weren't sitting on our hands. We were worshiping him. We're throwing our crowns. We're lifting up his name. We're singing a new song. We were made for that. You were created for that. You were created to get your significance from God. You were created to get your affirmation from Him and your walk with Him. You were created to get your acceptance from Him. You were created to get your self-esteem and your identity all from Him. Meekness puts that in the right order again. Self takes it out of order. Self takes it from the vertical to the horizontal. But meekness says, no, no, don't put it here. Keep it there, and you'll be safe. Remain teachable. Keep your ears open to the Spirit. Keep your ears open from God speaking through another Christian, which he'll do more times than not. Keep your ears open to the Word of God and submit yourself to the Word of God and, and be open to the, the Spirit of God interpreting the Word of God to you for you. Seek Him. Desire Him. Pursue Him. Listen when the Word is spoke, when the Bible is open, when you're in fellowship with other saints, when you're speaking heart to heart with your husband or wife or people that love you. Quiet your heart and hear what the Spirit of God may want to say. Park your opinions and listen. That's what meekness does. It can't be spiritual transformation or it will be muted at best if I don't understand this word. If I have said I can hear from this one and no one else, if I've driven parameters around me and... and um, Dictated who can speak into my life and who can't. If I never open my script, never open the scriptures, or when I approach the scriptures, I approach them from an academic or a, a, a mental standpoint. I never, I don't, I don't empty myself and ask God to speak to me through His Holy Spirit. I don't labor over the Word and hide it in my heart and beg that God would speak to me. What can I expect then? See, in my life, I, that's what I want. I'd like to think if I wasn't pastoring, that's still what I'd want. 
I'd like to think if I worked someplace in a factory, I would still have the same conviction. I pray that it would be. That I'd get up in the morning and open the scriptures and ask God to speak to me. And ask his Holy Spirit to come off the pages and illuminate to me. That I ask Chip Ingram, who I like, and Swindoll, and who's the other guy I like? Jeremiah, David Jeremiah. Some of you like him too. But I like him more. <laughs> to speak to me. When I'm in fellowship with other saints, I listen. When people give me their wisdom, I, I key in because I think it could be God speaking to them, through them, even if they're a donkey. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> and, um, that's what meekness does. It kicks the door open for God through his Holy Spirit to speak to his children and transform them from the inside out. Dear Jesus, thank you for the precious people.